Uh, Minister, as is my want, I will ask the first question. You talked about the importance of jobs, that there will be 20% of the jobs over the next two to three years will be for the NDIS. Now, I've already seen an ad on air for defence industry jobs that is funded by the government. Is there a similar ad for NDIS jobs? And if not, why not? And also, don't we have to increase the value we place on caring professions? Because we often love them when we need them, but we don't champion them or really pay them all that well most of the time. Thanks, Lyndall, for the, for the question. Uh, we are at the moment developing some advertising for the um, NDIS and hopefully we'll be able to get that out um, in, the, in the coming months, including regarding the um, organisations which are being set up around the NDIS as well, one of which is the um, Safeguards Commission, which will obviously monitor the provision of services to the sector to make sure there is a quality of service being provided. Uh, in terms of employment outcomes and making sure that those in the, the sector are valued, what we, we hopefully can move to is a deregulated system. And then what we will see as the demand increases uh, within the system, we should also see uh, wages within the system uh, begin to rise. Uh, at the moment, we're obviously going through the process of developing the market. Um, this is transformational because uh, there isn't an existing market there in many communities. Um, so we've obviously, as we roll to full implementation in 2021, we will seek to develop the market and then where we can deregulate it. And then hopefully we'll let the market do its job and see the value placed on these services, remembering that Australia is becoming more and more a service-based economy. So my view is that will lead to uh, greater value of being placed on people who work in the sector. Thank you. And we have a question right up the back. Minister, thank you. I'm Christy Muir, the, Sen the CEO of the Centre for Social Impact. Um, the NDIS is fantastic and it's such a great thing for Australia to be really proud of. Um, and I'm looking forward to what might be achieved going forward. In, in terms of the employment outcomes, I'm interested around what role you would like to see employers start to play because, and, and you know, hats off to the government for making these statistics publicly available. But if I have a physical disability, at the end of last year, I had a 28% um, chance of getting a job if I was unemployed and I turned up to a disability employment service provider. By 52 weeks, I had a one in two chance, if I was lucky enough to be in that 28% group, I had a one in two chance of actually keeping that job. And so clearly there's more to be done in that systems piece around, well, what, what role do corporates and other organisations need to play around ensuring that there are more opportunities for employment and what kind of supports might need to be in place to help people with disabilities keep the jobs and be valuable contributors? Yeah. Excellent question. And I would uh, implore every, every business that's here and any businesses that are, that are listening, um, please uh, look to employ people with a disability. They bring a range of skills to your business uh, that, will, that will make it better. And uh, so I would implore you to make sure that you consider and look to employ, employ people with a disability. One of the great things about the NDIS, as, as I mentioned in my speech, is that it will also assist people with a disability get the supports they need to, to be able to, to gain employment and improve their employment outcomes. And as we roll the scheme out, this will be something that we'll be closely monitoring because that is how also we get the long-term investment outcomes that, that the NDIS should deliver us um, as a nation. And, and the, the, it's, the outcomes are staggering in terms of what it will do to lift our, our economic output if we are able to take on the challenge and say, yes, we are committed 
as the government is to rolling out the NDIS as a business community, we want to make sure that we play our part and employ people with a disability. And sadly, we do, still do see that some people uh, aren't, aren't accepted into employment outcomes because they have a disability. We've got to change that mentality and we've got to make sure that people with a disability are, are em employer's first choice uh, because what they what they can bring to a workforce. But does that figure that only one in two of those who get a job keep it 12 months later say that there's something going wrong even after the hurdle of actually getting the job has been jumped over? I, I think what it points to is we've got to make sure that we're providing the assistance that they need so that they can maintain a job and that's where I think the NDIS can play a really important role because if it's providing the services and assistance to people with disability while they're in, in the workforce, they sh they, you know, the hope is that they will be able to turn what employment outcomes that might have only lasted 12 months to employment outcomes which will last a lifetime, like the rest of us have, and there is no reason why we shouldn't aspire to that and work towards making sure it is a reality. Thank you. And there's a question just up on our right. Thank you. Um, Minister, thanks for your... My name's Jared Brody. I'm the CEO of Consumer Action Law Centre and also the chair of the Consumers Federation of Australia. Thank you for your presentation and also your, your leadership and championing of the NDIS. A couple of times you talked about um, deregulating prices and I'm curious to understand what, how you would articulate the goal or purpose of deregulation to be. I think from our observations we've seen in other markets that um, those steps, and I know markets are different, but looking at something like electricity, um, where prices have been deregulated, but what happened was that there was confusing prices, um, rising prices, consumer lack of trust and dissatisfaction. Um, how can we ensure that um, if we're moving to a market-based system, we're not going to go down that track? Yeah, uh, it, It's a good question. Uh, I think one of the things we've got to make sure we do first is establish the market and we've got to make sure it is well established and then we've got to make sure that the market will work uh, so it benefits participants. Uh, at, at, the, you know, at its heart, the NDIS is about making sure that people with a disability are at the centre of the scheme. So if we can develop a market so that they remain at the centre of the scheme, then I think we can um, Process to a proceed to a, a deregulated environment, but it, it, we're going to have to make sure that that market is fully developed, and that the market will ensure that the participant remains at the centre of the scheme. That is, that will be be the challenge. Obviously, we're not there yet because we have to get the scheme fully rolled out by 21, 22. Uh, so that's our big challenge at the moment. And then once we get to that stage, we're then going to have to look out, OK, how do we move to deregulation and ensure that those safeguards are there, that it remains a participant first scheme. Um, and look, that'll be a challenge that we need to really put our minds to uh, after we hit full implementation. Any other question just down here? We'll get a microphone to you. Uh, Minister Darren Disney from BP. Um, in, in a general policy reform sense, I'd be interested in your observations of the policy reform process as it relates to NDIS in the context of commenced with a Productivity Commission report, was subject to COEG processes and intergovernmental agreements. We're now in the middle of rollout still, but at, at that high level, are there, are there learnings for government, federal and state in terms of the policy reform process? Yeah. It's a, it's a very good question. I, I think there is, the, and look, being frank, I think the key lesson is where you can get state governments and the federal government focused on getting outcomes in the national interest rather than seeking short-term political opportunism, then reform is still possible in, in this nation. And, you know, you, you've got to hand it to the campaign, and, and it was a considerable campaign over about a decade, 
from people with disability and their carers to push for an NDIS type scheme. But then in the end, all governments basically committed to saying, yes, we need to do something. So the political will was there no matter what the uh, colour or persuasion of your politics. And I think, think that was very important. That said, and you know, today I very much wanted to paint a picture of you know, what the scheme will entail in the long term for our nation. We still have challenges when it comes to the rollout of the NDIS and we're still going to have to rely on, especially the Commonwealth and the state and territory governments working cooperatively together to make sure it, it realises its full potential because there are interfaces between the Commonwealth system and the state system, especially when it comes to the health systems, when it comes also to child protection systems, when it comes to correctional systems, uh, that we're still negotiating and working out. We're also doing bilateral agreements with each, each state and territory at the moment, and we've concluded with New South Wales, and that was done incredibly cooperatively. Uh, South Australia is progressing in the same way, and my hope is we can do it with the other states and territories. But ensuring that everyone keeps a focus on the national interests and puts that above um, sort of short-term political gains is, is absolutely essential for us to get get the key reform through that we need. I'm curious about that interaction between the states and territories and the Commonwealth, because I heard from someone who um, has a disabled child that uh, they were getting a service from their state or territory, and then they were told that that will now be provided by the NDIS. Is that how it's supposed to work, or is that a little bit of cost shifting? Uh, so. Ideally, um, the way it's meant to work is that there, there will be 460,000 participants initially within the NDIS and then there will be many hundreds of thousands who will con need uh, at what, what we call a continuity of support which will either come from existing Commonwealth or existing state programs. So I as long as everyone plays their part, uh, we shouldn't see cost shifting. Uh, but one of the no, yet yeah, because that never happens. But one of the things we we need to be very diligent about, and we've got to, you know, I continue to call on the good graces of the state and territory governments, is that given the importance of this scheme, that we don't get in cost shifting arguments. So with New South Wales, for instance, I met earlier with the minister two or three months ago because there was a worry around cost shifting uh, with out of home care, but because we're able to sit down, talk about it, work through it, we're able to agree what the methodology should be going forward. And that is now a model which we're using with every other state and territory in, in this area. And that is what it's going to require, full cooperation, because it would have been very easy for both of us to say, that's your responsibility, and for Ray Williams to say to me, well, no, that's your responsibility now, but we've just got to be bigger than that, especially given the importance of this scheme. Any other questions? No. I have one more, um, unsurprisingly. We've seen in a lot of um, places over the years, when you talk about, say, hospitals and healthcare, or you talk about aged care, or you talk about schools, there are times when things go badly wrong. Um, in aged care, we've seen over the years terrible examples of the way people have been treated and kind of in response to that, an increase, a step-by-step -step increasing of regulation. Things will go wrong in the NDIS because life is not perfect. How important is, is it to get the strong regulation right first up so you can respond to them without having to incrementally yeah. step things up? It's a it's a good question, Lyndall, and you're absolutely right. No matter everyone's best intentions, including everyone who works in the NDIA, who are, um, you know, they have a Herculean task in, in rolling the scheme out in the in the time frame that's been asked of them, uh, and they are absolutely committed to doing the job, and as we all are, to the best best of our abilities. But there will be there will be issues, there will be challenges going forward. Um, the fact that we've established, and it's already in operation, the Safeguards Commission, our hope is that that will be able to provide the light regulatory touch, which is required, and then if we see problems occur, 
in, in areas, uh, they will be able to look, investigate and come back to government and say, look, we need to do some more in this area uh, because we, we're worried or concerned about it. So it, it's very much we're, we're going to have to watch closely, we're going to have to monitor, but we've got the organisation already established to do that. Uh, and one of the key things that the government wanted to do was to make sure it was up and running uh, when we began full scheme rollout in New South Wales and South Australia. And it is up and running and it's, it, and it's ready to go. So the hope is, as long as it can do its job, and I'm confident that it will, we should be able to provide um, the regulatory touch necessary if problems do arise as the scheme rolls out. And a final question. Jennifer Sutton from the University of Melbourne. I'm interested to know whether you are thinking about the roll-on effects for the not-for-profit sector and particularly board-level accountabilities. So what, what does the government think the, uh, the uh, requirements for not-for-profit sector boards will be in, in administering their um, participation in the NDIS? So uh, my view is that as long as boards understand their, their roles and responsibilities, um, then they should be able to fully participate in the scheme under, under the current regulation um, because that we already have a lot of not-for-profits who are working in this sector and have been working under the old sort of block funding model um, and the rules and regulations that they were operating under under those old block funding models are more or less the same as what they are under, under the rollout of the NDIS. What it will do, though, is create, I think, more challenges for boards, and I think they're going to have to make sure that they continue to put the skills on their boards that are necessary, because a block funding model is very different to entering, or as the, as the, um, the sector enters into a more market-based approach. And there is not going to be the certainty there that there once was under, under block funding. So I think the most important thing is that they're going to have to make sure they've got the right skill set on their boards so as we move. And, and it is a transformational move from, from block funding and our welfare-based approach to this insurance-based market approach under the NDIS. So I think that is the thing that they have to sort of have top, top and front of mind. And that's all we've got time for. Uh, Minister Tien, thank you very much for your time and for an interesting discussion of a very big project. Thank you very Please much. Please thank the Minister.